Well, hey, family, it is good to be with you today. Uh, I hope in spite of all of the pressing circumstances in which we might presently find ourselves that you have experienced the nearness of God this week. Uh, I've been praying for you. I pray that you have been praying uh, for our church as well, for the nation, uh, especially in the face uh, of another horrible tragedy there in West Philadelphia uh, and the continued struggle for the personhood uh, of marginalized peoples in this nation, particularly African-American people. Uh, so in spite of all of that, uh, I do pray that we would continue to be the church and hope that the rest of the church, that God would see his church rise to this moment uh, and become the answer uh, to the great multiplicity of difficulties and complexities facing us during this time on top of COVID-19 and all of its related variables. I really do believe that at the end of the day, uh, if God's people would be God's people in every respect, that we can actually be the solution uh, to the many varied and layered problems uh, that currently face us as a nation. Uh, if this is your first time with Renovation Church, uh, special welcome to you. You need to know right out of the gate just a few things. Number one, this is not a perfect church and we never will be. Uh, we do believe that the grace of God applied to our lives and to the lives of any who have become a part of this community makes room for everyone to have their journey toward and with Jesus. And number two, that you can belong in this community uh, even before you believe. You don't have to have it all sorted. This is a place to explore, to discover, and hopefully find the power and the truth of what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. Uh, today, we are kicking off a very short series uh, that I have entitled Made for More Rebooted. And the hope of this series is to give us some not only theological framework, but practical instruction on what it means to be good stewards with the things that God places in our hands. Now, uh, I know talking about money can be a touchy subject uh, in the church and particularly a touchy subject in a time of such uncertainty, but biblical principles are there for these very moments. It's not in the abundance that we necessarily need to understand all of the wonderful truths that God has put in front of us uh, with respect to how we steward the resources sources that he puts in our hands. Yes, it's important in those times, but it is especially important in times where we have to make complicated and difficult choices with respect to the things that God has entrusted us with. And so over the next few weeks, we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about what the Bible has to say about how we manage that which God has trusted us with. And today, to kick off the series, we have a little bit of a uh, of a special situation. I'm coming to you live uh, from our Stone Mountain studio. Actually, that's a joke. I'm coming to you live uh, from one of the homes of one of our beloved staff members. Uh, and tonight, or today rather, we are, instead of having the normal sermon, going to have a conversation uh, around stewardship and really and more in-depthly a conversation on how debt uh, is related to generosity and really how it could inhibit generosity. And so uh, the, the auspices for the entire conversation is giving us the opportunity to understand that some of us want to be generous. We want to be financially free. We want to, to be able to give toward God in abundant ways, but we found ourselves enmeshed or entangled uh, in debt situations that have become incredible encumbrances. How do we face that? And what does the Bible have to say about debt and debt management uh, and navigating that difficulty in a biblical way? And so tonight, today we are uh, going to hear from a few special guests uh, who uh, I would say are material experts uh, far beyond my own grasp of uh, uh, some of the theology and certainly the practicality uh, around these matters. And we're just going to have a conversation uh, that we hope would be incredibly helpful and, uh, and hopefully will put you in a position uh, to find financial freedom so that in finding financial freedom, you can be released into the generosity that God would like to see you walk in. So I want to say a quick prayer 
And then I'm going to introduce our guests, and then we are going to jump into this conversation. Father, we ask now that you would guide this time, uh, that your spirit would be present in this conversation, that your spirit would be present in every home, every car, every back patio, every porch, uh, every place that this moment is being engaged. Would you be present? Would you help us to let down our guard? Lord, uh, this is not a conversation about what we want from anyone, but a conversation rather about what we desire for them. And that desire is freedom in every reasonable way. And so, Father God, would you guide our tongues, guide our time, give us wisdom to speak with clarity, and let us all be transformed in these few moments. We ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, as I said, we have a few special guests with us uh, for today's conversation, and I would like them to introduce themselves to you. So take it away. How you guys doing? How you guys doing today? Hey, how y'all doing today? Uh, my name is Lance Matthew. I'm Como Matthew. So good to be with you. And I'm Will Berg. I'm Molly Berg. Will, Molly, how we doing? Doing good. Hey. Feeling a little better? Yes, much. Good, good. Hey, everyone. I'm Dion Brown. And I'm Ashley Brown. How are you guys doing? We're doing right. good. Doing good. <laughs> Glad to be here. It is so good to see you guys. Thank you for spending this little bit of time with me and, and with all of us and, and serving our body in this way. Hey, I'm Will Langston. Good to be here. How you doing, bud? Doing good. Thank you. It is so good to see you and so good to be with you guys. Uh, so to kick off the conversation, I want to put a question before you that that actually was posed, I believe, by Como. I'm going to give her credit uh, as the better of that half. Uh, <laughs> but I believe the, the the question was posed by Como, and, and that is how it is that, that debt and generosity relate to one another. Uh, in other words, what is that relationship like? And I'll add a second to that. How can debt prohibit generosity? How would you respond to that, anybody? Uh, yeah, so I think when, uh, as we as we reflect on what, what the relationship is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taken back to our, our own story um, about how, you know, there was a time where we, we had uh, debt that we were trying to, um, get rid of to pay to pay off um, because there was just choices that that I've personally made in my life maybe we made collectively or maybe where, where we came into marriage with and um, and there was a coming to a moment of where God spoke that you know being in debt is not something that um, that we should do and so what that turned into is is was a was it was a desire to free ourselves from something that was actually keeping us from stewarding uh, resources that were never ours to begin with. But because of how we, or how I personally, and how I was, uh, whether that's upbringing, whether that's culture, whether that's just behavior, I've made choices to treat uh, the way that I live as if uh, everything before me was mine for the taking. It was mine for the owning. And as if uh, uh, everything was available for me to to consume, and so all of those choices culminated into a building up of debt, and um, as as that mountain builds up, it actually uh, not knowing at the time because I was not walking with Christ, but not knowing that that mountain was actually keeping me from scaling the mountain of being able to give to the kingdom, which is actually all his. And so I was prohibiting myself and even um, us as a family from being able to give in a way because we were we were actually giving to ourselves first rather than giving into him. And so the giving in to ourselves was developing a consumption model that just led into a debt building. And and it was contradictory to being able to to give as freely as we we ever desired to give. Hey, Como, um, Lance said something that I would love to hear you unpack a little further. He said that I lived as though this was mine in the first place. Can you unpack that a little bit? What is he saying in that statement? And then what is the biblical counter to that idea? 
Well, specifically, I think it will, Lance made some choices of getting property or, you know, taking on, you know, a car loan or whatever it was that he wanted at the time. I made my own decisions in that way. And so it was operating as if we didn't ha we had no options but to serve ourselves, you know. And so when we both came to the Lord, we sort of had a different, we, had, we first came to the Lord in different ways, but we both came as second generation immigrants, which is, um, you know, we're, his parents are Indian born, my parents are African born, so, so we're American born. So we have this life that we've seen our parents sort of like in, in person, in our families, in our culture, just put aside whatever it was that they wanted for themselves um, for the sake of the future of our family. And so to me, the relationship between debt and um, generosity, there's a, there's a word in between that connects it for me. It's sacrifice. And All so right. we sort of grew up seeing that visibly. But it's different when you see it and you feel that expectation, like there's this load that we want to make sure that we... We honor, but we also carry that they've done a lot for us. So we want to make sure that we honor the, their efforts. But there's a, there's a there's a part of that that being American born that you can almost feel the consumerism and you, you, you see everything that you want. And so it's there for your taking. And so I think because of the work that they did, it almost gave us a lot of options. And with those options, it became, all right, so I, I wanted when I was 16 a brand new car. Okay, get a brand new car. Is that the best idea? Probably, probably not for a sixteen-year-old, you know. Or uh, we couldn't get approved for a loan um, for a condo. So instead of a two-bedroom, we'll get a one-bedroom, but it'll still be interest only, you know. Yeah. So somehow America will figure out a way they have to get you what you want. And I think when we came into marriage with lots, both of us, lot. I mean, there's a lot of debt um, that it was all right, what are we going to do now? Lance had already started on the journey of paying it off for, for about two years. And so um, that was something the Lord had put on, on his heart through a service. And, and he took a class and the class led to learning how to steward the practical ways of stewarding um, his money. But I was raised in a way that debt really wasn't something that we did. We paid off everything. But I didn't have the vision for oh, this is what you do when you don't have debt. This is what you do with your money, or here's how you can build God's kingdom because that wasn't my, my background. It was yeah. you, you save it, you keep it, and you buy stuff for yourself. And mm -hmm. so I think what God has shown us over many, many years is um, it's not ours. Um, we're managers, not owners. And, yes. and not only is that, whether that's a sacrificial thing that you learn, I think it's more gain than it is sacrifice. Like we, that's where we sort of see it now. So um, I know my, our experience is different than some of the other um, couples and will, but like, I just feel that that, re that point of sacrifice has been key for us because it shows us even God's willingness to take on our debt, you know, and, and be, sa and sacrifice himself for us. It just, Talk about that gospel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, I would love to hear uh, either from Will or from Ashley and Dion or, or Will and Molly, uh, if you care to share a little bit about your journey as well, because I think that's powerful. And I want to put a pin in this. I'm going to come back to it. But there's something you said about the consumptive nature of Western culture, particularly the, the culture here in the U.S. And I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to put a Bible verse on it and get you guys' thoughts on it. So don't let me lose that thought. Uh, but I'd love to hear uh, from a few of you others as well, kind of uh, in response to that question, the relationship between debt and generosity and just what your journey has been like toward greater financial freedom. I think that we have realized over the years that as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, for those of us who are everything in life, we strive to be open to Jesus and to be following him with everything that we have. And debt is something that becomes another another chain to hold us back from oh, doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are unable to give our resources freely if they are tied up in some sort of debt. And as we have had the gift of being able to be debt free, we have been able to give in so many ways that I don't think I would have expected that we would have in the past. 
and at no point has it made us feel like oh, this is enough now. Like now we've gotten to a point that, that we're good. We've given enough. That's just not the life that Jesus calls us into. The more we give, the more we gain. And it's very hard to get that gain with being in debt. Yeah. And you know, it's beautiful about that. Even as you said, that's the life Jesus calls us into. You said something very powerful there that you don't get to a place where it's like, okay, we've given enough. Like what if, what if God got to that place and, and he's like, you know what? When I made the world, I gave enough. Or when I threw the rainbow in the sky and said, I never flood the world again, I gave enough. Right. Uh, or when I gave Jesus on the cross, I gave enough. When I gave the spirit, I gave enough. Uh, but, but it's, it's a beautiful picture that what we're actually doing is just reflecting the God that we've been called to follow because he never stops giving out of, you know, out of his abundance, out of the overflow of his presence. And the more that we gain and then give, the more that we gain, it's this beautiful cyclical pattern that we get to live. That's really just reflective of the nature and heart of God himself in the gospel. And then beyond the gospel in the giving of the spirit and the multiplying of the church. It, it do you, does that resonate with you guys as well? Amen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the foundations that we build in Jesus are always going to stand and the giving that we give towards his kingdom is going to stand because of what he has given us, not because of how great our efforts are, but because of the foundation that he has laid for us. Amen. Amen. Ashley and Dion, what do you think? Yeah. Thanks for asking. So, I think Ashley and I both believe that in the Bible, God's very clear on he wants our first fruits and he wants the best um, that we have to offer. And specifically to our story, when we first got together, um, as many Americans do, we had two credit cards that were maxed out. We had a car loan, we had student loans. So it was at the end of every month, we were trying to pay those off and those were monthly bills that we had that kept coming. We wanted to give, to the church and give to, to things that God wanted us to, to donate to and be compassionate towards, but we didn't have any money left over. Oh. Um, and the times that we did have money left over might've been 20 or $30 um, that we would give to the church. Um, and, and obviously we knew that we wanted to give, but we just, we didn't have it um, basically there to give. Um, so we took a couple of financial courses just to see how we could get our, our heads from below the water. Um, and we found out that we needed to make a budget and start tracking all of our expenses and seeing where our money was going. Um, and we, re we realized that we had a lot of space that we could use. We were spending money at Starbucks that we didn't need to be spending money on or uh, going to Chick-fil-A a bunch, things of that nature where we, we freed up some of our money to where we could give to the church. Um, and we just took baby steps and baby steps and kept building and building um, as we were paying off our debt so that we could give more. Um, so we, we believe that debt is something that it, it's, it's as far apart from God's generosity as it can be, basically, because it's in America, that's, the, that's what your mindset is towards, is we have to make the payment to our debtors first before we can make our payment to God, where it should be the other way around. Wow. Yeah, I like the, like what Molly was saying about it being shackles. Um, that's definitely how I felt. And we grew up in very different households. Um, we're like, in my household, debt was something like I was actually taught by my parents. Like, you're always going to owe someone something. So just decide like where you're going to wow. owe to. And his parents, completely opposite, like debt free to the core. Um, and so that was really interesting coming into it and Dion being like, Hey, you know, that just doesn't have to be a lifestyle. Like we can be free from this. I was like, well, I would love it because I feel heavy all the time. Like mm -hmm. just the weight of everything, um, financially. And so that's kind of where we took that step to be like, okay, well, let's get it taken care of. And then as soon as we became debt free. It was just literally like, it felt like the shackles fell off and it's just been the most freeing um, experience to be able to give more. And now like be able to say that's the highest priority to give more every year and make goals to give, not goals to pay off debt mm. and more debt. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, that uh, again, something very powerful that I don't want us to miss. Because we can get into this type of conversation, and I want to stay with you, Ashley and Dion. Uh, we can get into this conversation 
and feel overwhelmed, right? And, and we look at, as, as uh, you just said, the bills keep coming every month. And there's school loans and there's car loans and there's credit cards and and charge cards from the store and, and you know, makeup cards and, and, and shoe allowances and all this, you know, all this stuff. And, and by the way, when I said shoe allowances, I was talking about the fellas because I got a shoe problem. <laughs> But, uh, you know, all of these things start to build and start to mount. And then to your point, Ashley, it really is a cultural idiom that you're just going to owe somebody. You know, I I remember having that same conversation uh, when I approached one of my friends and I said, hey, I'm going to pay off my student loan debt. And he's like, that's crazy. It's only 150 bucks a month, man. That's just let it ride, you know, you, you, you're going to be paying, paying it off forever anyway. I mean, that's the only guarantee in America is taxes and student loan debts, right? And, <laughs> and I said, you know, yeah, I guess you're right. And I allowed that thought to take seed and, and take or, or to, to root into my mind and really accepted the fact that I'm always going to be in debt. And then I open up the Bible and Romans says, oh, nothing to no one. And I'm like, okay. So what do I do with this? You know, the 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 American value system says you're always going to owe something. The Bible says owe nothing to anyone. How do we hold those things in tension? So that that's one big idea. But where I want to drill down at in the face of how this could feel totally overwhelming is you guys said we took baby steps. And, and I think that's an important thing to point out. I'd love for you to reiterate that if you have anything further to say on it and just and, and kind of press it down for us because I think that most people get to the moment where they accept the idea I want to be free from financial debt and then they look at how much is owed and they and then the second thought comes I'll never be free from this and so then no steps are taken so how did you take that first baby step and then decide to take a second and a third and what motivated you to just keep going um, and, and to just chip away at it even when it seemed insurmountable? Yeah, Dion kind of hit on it. I think it starts with just looking at what you do have and get out of the mindset of like, what all do I not have? But what is what are the resources that I have? For us, we went straight back to like college budget in a way <laughs> um, where it was like we were eating nutritional food, but like we weren't trying to live extravagantly at all and having date nights with like a Netflix movie and cookies like was our, and so it just goes back to like really going back to basics, figuring out um, like I don't know, just taking it back to, like I said, seeing all of the different line items that you have to pay, seeing what you actually need, and then breaking it down from there. And I think too, reading and learning about what there is available is a huge thing. Um, and having, if you have someone that's trusted um, by your side to maybe help you walk through it and take a look at it from a different lens too, is really beneficial as well. Yeah. Did you ever feel like giving up? Um, I didn't, but I'm just like a goal getter kind of. So like <laughs> I wanted, but like, and it was almost more of like a proving to myself that I, I wanted to get it done. So, and he wouldn't have ever let us give up. So I never had it in my head really, but <laughs> <laughs> I could, it, it was hard. Like I said, having other people keep you accountable for it is, what helps keep the motivation going too. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. What about you, Mr. Langston? You care to share a little bit about your journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, to the question you asked, um, you know, what if it feels overwhelming and how do you take baby steps? I think there's several different names for maybe what this method is, but really what, what I've heard from uh, not only from my own personal experience, but from uh, other people as well, is uh, just this idea of like a snowball method. So you you kind of pay minimum payments on everything except your smallest debt, and then you pay that debt off. And then once that debt is paid off, you add what you were paying towards that debt to the next smallest. All right. And so as you pay off every small debt, the snowball grows, so to speak, as it's kind of going downhill. 
and you're being able to add more and more money to those smallest debts, um, that is that has worked for me. I didn't have I was I was blessed enough to not have a whole lot of debt when I first started this journey several years ago. Um, I really only had uh, I was I was blessed enough to have parents who paid uh, for for my college expenses, and I also did a lot to offset a lot of those expenses. Um, and so I've I, praise God I've never had student debt. Um, I know how few people can say that. But when I got out of college, it really was like a jump into the debt cycle type thing because that's what you do. Yeah. Um, you need you need something. You don't have the money. You get credit for it. Yeah. I move into my first apartment. I don't have furniture. I got to go buy furniture. I got to put it on a, a credit card. Uh, you know, I, I I need an engine replacement in my car. I go buy another car, and I don't have the cash for it. I. I, you know, get uh, fleeced on a car. Yeah. Um, and so those were really the two big payments that I had. And the with, with the snowball method, I just said, I'm going to pay minimum payments on my car until I get this furniture paid off, pay the furniture off. Then I put, uh, like Ashley and Dion were saying, cut back the lifestyle, put a governor on what you're spending your money on, uh, and just try and focus all of your attention financially on your smallest debts and then continue to pay them off accordingly. And by God's grace, I, I paid my car off uh, a handful of years ago. I haven't had a car payment since then. I, I haven't had any debt. I don't even know what my credit score is. I hope it's zero. Um, and uh, I, so I didn't get very deep into debt, but I can tell you from my personal experience that being debt free and living debt free and not having all these different masters that you're having to serve and, and all these different places that your income is going out to, you can actually, when you don't have debt, you actually have money. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's been, that's kind of been my experience. Thank you all for sharing that. Uh, and I'm going to circle back all the way to the beginning and, and the, the, the big question over the top of what I'm going to say next is, and all of you have touched on it is how, how do we get here or or why do we get into the debt cycle and, and uh, there's one data point I want to touch on and then I'm going to I'm going to jump into the word here for just a second um but every year uh US citizens by and large spend 1 to 2% more than they make now think about that uh the nation has a deficit. Our nation doesn't have a balanced zero-sum budget. <laughs> Our nation doesn't. And, and we, as citizens of this nation, uh, every year spend 1% to 2%, literally, more than we make. So how in the world are we ever going to get out of debt when we are spending more than even the revenue that we bring into the house? So it's not... It, it's. It's even beyond mismanagement of what we have. It, it extends beyond that into the realm of we are literally spending money that's not even in the house. And, and I was reminded as I was preparing for the week of, of Proverbs 21, 20. And it says precious treasure and oil. OK, that was uh, that was f fat money uh, for uh, for the time period in which this was written. Right. They didn't have. Uh, um the the same currency that we uh, use, they bartered with oil and wine and and sheep and lamb. You know, uh, total total tangent. Uh, I've been listening through the Bible from front to back, and I'm in First and Second Samuel right now, and I just chuckled to myself because uh, it was talking about David approaching this very wealthy man, and it was like he had two hundred head of cattle and two hundred sheep, and you know. 300, you know, the ears of corn and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, what a great economy that was. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Proverbs 21, 20, precious treasure and oil are in the wise man's dwelling, but a foolish person devours it all. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's straight out of the word of God. Like how, how do you apply a passage like that or, or, or in, and anybody feel free to jump in, but what is your takeaway from that text? Especially in light of, and again, I think it was Como that, that kind of 
drove us deeper into this idea of the consumptive nature of Westerners in particular, and all of you guys touched on it in different ways. Um, but how do like what's what's our takeaway from a text like that? If precious oil and, and, and treasure in the house of a wise person, but a foolish person devours it all, how, how do we apply that in our time today? I think we get our treasures mixed up a lot, especially in this country. Um, especially as you even said, we spend money that isn't in the house. And a lot of the time we spend it to get things that don't belong in the house. Okay. Um, we personally, the first time we became debt free, it was from student loan debts. Yeah. We, we quickly, after paying off our student loan debt, decided to buy a new truck. So <laughs> we got right back into it. Um, it was just, it was the next thing to do. Um, and we did that good Christian thing where you say, well, if we get a truck, a nice new truck, we can help people move. Oh, and yeah. We can do all these things. And that's a great reason to go into debt. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. wow. So. Man. Uh, the temptation is strong everywhere to do what um, Molly, you were just saying. You know, I think sometimes when we think about moving, we're like, oh, we could host more. You know, we host, you guys know we have hosted like 40 people in this room. Yeah. Um, but but we, but that, that temptation to think that, oh, once we get into more debt, we'll be able to do more. I mean, it's so clear when we see it in our kids, when we give them like a piece of candy and they're like, more, more, more. Mm -hmm. You just, you're like, no, you're getting, you know, you're asking now for unnecessary things that is going to be unhealthy for you. Yeah. And I, I, we sophisticate it because we're adults, but we essentially throw those same tantrums, I think. And then there's available, you know, money and (laughs) in different places that someone's always willing to give you a loan for what you want that it becomes hard to say no i mean it becomes hard to say unless you really realign and reorient yourself again and again like the lord is my master you know Mm -hmm. um and and what he provides is a perfect provision as opposed to like well he's given us a thousand dollars but i just needed one percent more Mm -hmm. and where can i get that one percent more um I mean, God really put it, has put it on my heart over and over when I, when I feel that feeling that, um, that there's a lack of gratitude on my, on my part, you know, to say yeah. like, wow. God, thanks for giving this, but I need just a little bit more. And it, yeah. it, it's not really the desire that I have to worship the Lord to yeah. say, um, you're not giving me enough. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I, and you know, I would, I would also like to say it's, uh, you know, we find ourselves here as, as a society because of just the, the instancy of how we can get everything. You know, there is there is no, when, when, when we read a foolish man devours all he has, it's so, it's so easy to be foolish because everything is actually available for instant consumption. You know, we, there's, 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 there's guardrails that we can put in place when we're walking in the spirit, but man, the flesh, the, the society, I mean, since we were born, we had the ability to get what we wanted in a moment because we cried for it, right? You know, that's, that's our first instinct is to cry for something and get it immediately, you know? And so that just keeps perpetuating. And so we just end up just continuously devouring because there's, there's no reason to hold yourself back. You know, it's a colloquial word of, uh, of YOLO or like any, any of that kind of stuff where why, why wait for something when we could just get it now. And, and by doing that, we're literally, devouring any any everything that we have and yeah and there's a lot of self-deception I, I would say like in the beginning of us doing this um lance challenged me when we were dating and he said you know you've been working you're making double i was working part-time and i was making about i don't know less than 20 and then i ended up getting a full-time position and i had way more in the full-time position than in the part-time but i had no savings there was nothing to show for it and I said, and he's like, I don't, he's like, you don't have any savings. And I said, well, you know, I go out to eat a lot with people and, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, <laughs> with friends and it's good to like, you know. You're just building community. Uh, have fellowship. I use, you know, you use that word, you know, coffee <laughs> and you need that. And then I, he's like, well, just track it, you know, like in the, in the, the way that we do with budgets, every dollar when it comes in, what did I do with it? And we tracked it. 
And I realized almost all of the times I used that money, it was by myself. It was, wow. I'm in the mood for a coffee. I'm going to go get a coffee. I'm in the mood for a burger. I'm going to go get it. It wasn't, a lot of that was not spending time with people. I think I had deceived myself and like almost made it seem like it was, it was a good use of my money because I was doing it for whatever. You could, you could use any good excuse, you know, it could be ministry, it could be fellowship, but it actually ends up being just for yourself. And yeah. that was a big eye-opener, I think, for me to see myself as a consumer and not just as someone that was, you know, walking with good intentions. Yeah, yeah. man, that is, that is really, really powerful. Um, so we are kind of coming to the close of our time. And you all have been so helpful. And there's a couple other high points I'd love to hit. Um, can we talk about practical tools? Uh, right? So um, there are a number of verses. I'll rattle off a few here. Proverbs 21, 20, Proverbs 22, 7, uh, Romans 13, 8, Luke 14, 28, which really touches on what you just said. Who who decides to do something without first sitting down and counting the costs, right? That's what Jesus says. You don't you don't decide to build a building without sitting down and first counting the costs. You don't decide to go out to battle without sitting down and first counting the costs. And 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 it's in the context of financial stewardship. You don't take on something uh, without actually understanding whether you can cover the breadth of what it's going to cost you. Uh, and then there's Hebrews thirteen five, and I'm going to come to this one twice. Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your life free of the love of money and be content with what you have, right? Now, you would think that the because would be because God has been good to you or God will meet your needs or God will be your provision and all of those things are true. But I love Hebrews 13, 5 because the because is this, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, hmm. <laughs> Right? What a powerful promise. Because at the end of the day, material provision is not wrong. And in, in, and in many cases, it's quite good. Uh, being wealthy is not wrong. It's just difficult. But here, in response to keeping ourselves from loving money and finding contentment, it is not in the satisfaction of the material thing that God will give, but that God will give himself. What a gift and what a promise that is. Mm. And, and, and so in light of all of those things, I want to go twofold. The first is practicality. So let's say that that I'm on the other side of this conversation and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I was expected, you know, I expected to get guilted today or to get bombarded today. I expected PL to get worked up and preach at me about getting debt free, right? Like that's what I expected. And here we are having this conversation through other people's stories about how God gave them both the wisdom and the tools to find financial freedom. Where do we start? What, what, what are the practical next steps that we should take uh, if we are feeling the tug? And I hope we all are, right? I hope we all are based on what the word of God has to say about this and the promise of God to be ever present with us. Then what do we do next? I think a big thing that stuck out to me was um, one of our prep texts was in Romans 13. Um, and, I, and reading before that, and a chapter before, Paul calls us to the renewing of our minds. Yeah. Um, and I think a big thing that holds us back from being debt free and from even seeking that is that we are just so conformed to the world and the society we're a part of. And it's just, it's so ingrained in everything we know and do. So until we try and educate ourselves and try and see the world in the way that the people who are trying to get us to get into debt see us, then we're going to just continue to be led um, in the way that the world's going to lead us. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is just being able to understand what, what is my relationship to money? Um, what does God see for our relationship with money and our relationship with him? And how do we renew our minds and see it the way that he sees it? Amen. I think a great way to do that, too, is to get in community with people that are trying to do the same thing that you're doing, that want the same freedom that you want and want to be able to to give in the same ways. Because if you are surrounded by voices of the world instead of 
by voices of people that can be accountability with you and community with you, that's going to be really, really hard to do. I think that most people in this call that, that have gotten debt free have done that in community and accountability. So find people that can do that with you and then hold you accountable through God's word as well. Yeah. Matthews, I know that you guys have run a financial freedom playbook for, for some time. And I know we can't get into all of it uh, in this conversation, but uh, along the same lines of renewing our mind and putting ourselves in, in communities of like-minded people who want that same freedom, uh, mm -hmm. what is the practical next step that you would invite me into? Yeah. I mean, I think, trying to get rid uh, of this student loan debt, Doc. <laughs> Tell me what <laughs> yeah, to and do. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the, what, what Will and Molly have touched on and what you're saying is, you got to understand your why first, right? You got to you got to you got to start with the, you got to begin with the end in mind, and so you got to understand why it is that you're trying, what it is that you're trying to get out of under right now, and so once that's there, and that's the spiritual step, right? That's the, that's the philosophical step. Then it then it's about mm -hmm. now a, a big part of why we were in the mess we were in is because we actually did uh, practical behavioral choices over time, right? Yeah. And that has culminated into the position we're in. And so it's almost you kind of have to kind of go back in reverse. And, and as you as you um, cited Luke 14 and about how Jesus in his own words talks about who what builder starts to build a building without counting the, counting the cost. And that's literally a picture of, of budgeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we can't we can't do any anything that we're talking about here, anything that we're talking about at a spiritual level or even a results based mentality. Like it can't start without putting something down to give you a visual of what's happening with what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And so a budgeting is probably like the, the, if there's a foundation to what stewardship looks like practically, it cannot be done without a budget. And so we believe in a mentality of budgeting for the rest of your life, doing a monthly budget where you're, where you're considering how much money is coming in before it even hits your pocket, before it hits your bank account, before it comes into place, right? You figure out what that income is going to be, and then you give it a name. Like Como said earlier, you, you name every dollar. Yeah. And so you, you lay down, you, you decide how much you're going to give. Um, you decide how much is your living expenses. There are certain parameters you got to set around different categories, what, what your food budget should be, what your living budget should be. Um, and then... And then if you're still in debt, you know that you have to service your debt. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is, if you're trying to get out of debt, you want to squeeze every single penny that you have and shift it from any other level of consumption and give it over to debt and paying off debt. This is what we talk about, just an intensity with, with paying off debt, you know. And so you, that's why it's important to know that why first, because you have to. I think you asked the question earlier to, to Ashley, was it ever hard? Did you want to give up it? And the truth is like, it's, it's going to be easy to give up because sometimes for a lot of us, it's a long road. Um, and without that intensity, like keeping there, it's, it's going to be a hard thing. And so doing the budget every month, giving the dollar a, a name and, and, and really putting, putting a roadmap against all your debts will, man, will okay. describe it great that snowball again we believe in that too um just attacking one one debt at a time you know i, I love i love sayings it's like he says how do you eat an elephant you know one bite at a time, at a time. you know <laughs> and so you 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 just have to attack it with intentionality over and over and over and over again and, and then that that's what it comes into place but really once you start this process it never stops once you start budgeting it never stops budgeting. We've been budgeting yeah. for 10, 10 years mm -hmm. um, and, and we slack off. But when we slack off from doing the, the budget, we feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, we feel like, oh, man, we haven't talked in two months about the budget. Mm -hmm. And and it's it, it should be autopilot, but it still f doesn't feel right because we're yeah. it's such an ingrained behavior. Now. And it, it puts us back into that cycle of asking ourselves why. Um, going back through the budgeting and then doing what Ashley you mentioned like setting these goals like we talk about every quarter what is the thing that we're trying to do we want to be we want to give this much or we have certain commitments all right well if we want to meet that we talk about it all right we're at this way that we're at this point we have to continue doing these things if we want to make it to this mm -hmm. point and so that is actually very motivating it doesn't feel discouraging it feels like oh my gosh we're so close you know mm -hmm. it's 
It's getting rid of the student loan instead of $150 a month at a time, like being intense about it. And then, I mean, that's one of our stories too. In a, less than a year, it was done because of debt snowball, because you had the, the rolling rhythm and discipline that was set. And then the accountability, I would say, to add to that, because you can set out the budget, but if you don't have someone that can tell you the truth, um, when you may convince yourself of other things, um, you know, then then it's very hard to stick the, stick to this this road because we need people to say like, I know you're having a hard time and you want you know to watch Netflix or but you may not need five subscriptions, you may just need one. You know, so just having somebody tell you very practical things in a in, in a truthful way, but in a kind way too, and reminding you of why you're doing what you're doing has been really helpful to us. And we still seek that even as a married couple from outside yeah. places. So, yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank you all so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to turn us toward a close. And, but before I do, I just want to tell you how grateful I am that you brought both your, uh, your passion and your heart and your story and your knowledge to this moment and uh, for every one of you, I believe that that renovation and, and even the people beyond renovation who will see this will be immensely blessed. Uh, as we close our time, there's two things that I want to do. First, uh, I want to relieve you, hopefully, of any guilt or shame. That is not the goal of this moment. And in fact, uh, Hebrews is such a powerful passage to touch on that reality from two different dynamics. Uh, the the promise of contentment uh, and the freedom from the love of money is not rested or nested in the things that God puts in our hands, but it's actually in him. He, he is the promise. He is the treasure. And, and until Jesus is the treasure and until Jesus is at the center, we can give you all the practical tools in the world. You will continue to run back to the ingrained patterns that I will continue to run back to the ingrained patterns that we've learned uh, over time from our families, from our nurture, from our nature, from our culture. Only proximity to Jesus frees us from the love of possessions. Only proximity to Jesus frees us from the love of possessions. And the promise of contentment is not rested in the material things that he places in our hands but in the fact that he will never leave, he will never forsake, whether we have much or little, whether we have abundance uh, or need, he is ever present. That is the promise. And the other side of that is that that promise also frees us and forgives us for the ways that we have sinfully behaved with those things that we thought were ours. And so here's the invitation today, that if you're a follower of Jesus, there's no guilt here for you because you're going to take all of these ideas, these tensions, these struggles, and you're going to lay them at the foot of the cross and you're going to put yourself proximate to Jesus and feel that freedom once again. And he will be the energy and the motivation for you to run toward financial freedom so that you can be beautifully generous. And for those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus, there's no guilt for you. Because every principle we put in front of you for you to try to muster the will to do it will actually work against your very nature and will only leave you tired and angry and frustrated and hurting. But if you would put your trust in Jesus right now, then he would provide a presence and a freedom and a hope and a joy that will allow you to release your hands from the cultural definition of who you are and firmly grip who God says you are, a beloved child. In fact, he gave himself in Jesus in generosity through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for that very reason. And so I want to say a quick prayer. And if you would, pray that with me if you feel God drawing you to himself now so that you might experience the power of this transformation. Pray this with me if you would. Father, I don't have it all sorted. My mind is fully entangled in the way this world works. But I want more. I want contentment. I want joy. I want freedom. But most of all, I want you. 
And so would you transform me now? Would you forgive me for my sin and the way that I have rejected your love and leading? And would you be my Savior and my Lord? In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, everything is different right now. It'll never be the same. And so what I'd love to invite you to do is join us, uh, one of our pastors or one of our leaders in our digital lobby, right now so that we can tell you the next step to take in your life with Jesus and his people. Last word here. There were several important things said today, but I believe the most important was understanding our why. If we want to get financially free just so that we can accrue more things, then we'll never truly be free. But if we want financial freedom and freedom from debt so that we can have the contentment that only God can provide and the freedom to give toward eternal investment, toward eternal joy, toward the transformation of lives and cities, well, then that's a why worth living for. And it is our earnest hope that this conversation and the many that would follow the financial freedom groups that will be happening in the spring and every other tool that we put in front of you would be leveraged to see that why come to life so that you can have the abundant life that Jesus promised in John 10, 10. I love you. I've enjoyed this time so much. Thank you for giving us your time to serve you and we'll see you next time.